all gowned up, masked up, all overnight, and I watched him in the bed, in pain, sweating. The nurses came every so often. She's in theatre, I don't know which one. Okay, thanks. Bye. By, you know, seven, eight o'clock that morning, a male nurse, he said, it's, it's pneumonia and we've got him on antibiotics and the, the bug doesn't like the antibiotics. And I said, well, do you know when this bed's gonna, you know, he looks incredibly uncomfortable. I just thought at least when he gets into the hospital, he might start to feel better. Because if anything, he looked worse than the night before. And he said, well, we'll have to get him in bed in the next hour because the hospital gets a huge fine if they're in emergency for any more than 24 hours. They took him to the spinal unit because that was the only isolated room they had available at the time. I lied back on the bed and I just looked at my chest and it was just heaving. And I just started building up all this panic and, and I just, was feeling just so bad. He managed to get out. Don't want to see mum and dad just need to concentrate on breathing. The nurse hit the medical alert switch on the wall and she said, look, there's a, a lot of people are about to come in. There had to be 20 people around the bed. She screamed to me, I don't know what I got, but can you just at least knock me out? Ten days after being sent away from emergency with two Panadol, he was in intensive care. I couldn't believe the enormity of it. I just didn't know what was happening. This is my son. David, you know, he'd, he'd had the flu, he'd been unwell, I thought it was pneumonia. You know, what is happening? What was happening? When I saw David first, he was uh, unconscious. The heart valve was leaking severely. The heart was failing. He was already in an infection shock as well, and his kidneys were failing. His organs were failing. David's heart was just ripped apart by a bacterial infection, and it was the type of bacteria that normally causes pneumonia in the lungs. I had to have a brief uh, chat to his parents and his partner, Leah. And um, at that time, we had to tell him that the chances of him surviving were pretty remote. And I just said, just save my boy's life. You <laughs> know, just give us back our son. <laughs> we opened his chest and I then opened his aorta. My heart sank because what we saw was something that I had not encountered before and I did not know where to begin. After they'd worked on him for 16 hours, they sat us down and said, it's not looking good. He's the sickest, David is the sickest man in Melbourne. When you hear that someone like is possibly going to die, it's a possibility. And you think of never being able to talk to that person again. And also for me, there's probably a little bit of uh, things that I wanted to say to Dave and and hadn't had the chance. And and I just it was I was a wreck. Dave was invincible. You know, he lived life like not many people get the chance to do, or even when given the chance, don't take it. You know. Never in my wildest dreams would you ever think for a second that something like this would happen to someone like that. Oh, yeah. Very happy. I got some little That's good. Piece if you want some. We're all very happy you're here, Dave. By January, he'd yeah, January 2010, he within six months he'd undergone two open heart surgeries that were over 16 hours in length. He'd survived two major strokes, one which took out half his eyesight and one which would have killed him if they hadn't have removed his skull. If Dave hadn't been sent away from emergency the first time he presented, I don't think any of this would have happened. I don't think there was any way of recognising that uh, this was a far more serious um, chest infection. 
the cause of the heart problems and the destruction of the heart was all bacterial and definitely had nothing to do with swine flu. His heart surgeon, Dr. Seven, just an incredible human being. And I don't think David would be alive if it wasn't for that man. I had the huge regret that we weren't officially husband and wife, that we hadn't managed to do that. The phone rang and it was Leah and she said, we're gonna, we're gonna get married and would you, you know, would you play a song at the wedding? Just turned out, ha happened by coincidence to be the day of the big day out in Melbourne. We went to the rehabilitation centre. It was a shock to see him that way, because I hadn't seen him, you know, and to see him in a suit that looked like it was five times bigger than him purely because he'd just lost so much weight. By the authority vested in me, I now pronounce you to be husband and wife. You know, kiss your brother. Thank you. You're welcome. When the band started playing and Nick started singing, it was, um, it was amazing. Don't have to tell you. I just uh, turned into Dave and just cuddled him and I guess you could say it was our wedding dance because <laughs> everyone said, you know, we were kind of dancing, we were rocking, but um, it was that moment I got to have with him, oblivious to everyone else in the band was sort of uh, around us at the time and it was beautiful. But I got to look in his eyes and, you know, I think I said, you know, now I'm your wife. Even though I was still very, very sick, you know, and I think I had to have surgery the next day, um, but it's still one of the best days of my life, if not the best day of my life. Oh, have wings. Some of us don't know why. It was a bit tough to sing that, actually. It's pretty hard to sing uh, about love and uh, remaining together when, you know, the, f the future's in doubt, you know. They did at one point try and put his original skull back in. I think that was in March 2010. And unfortunately, good old hospital golden staph infection meant that they had to remove it. And that was the first time I saw David uh, really break down. After 12 months, I probably, like, I'm a little bit at the end of my tether with it. I've come in and out and in and out and in and out of hospital and I've waited so many times. David should never be picking Leroy up in his ears. It's like trying to control mayhem. Um, without the ability to, you know, and yet I, I have to constantly have the answers to the next thing that's going to happen and I don't even know how to do it. Leah's changed. She's gone from being someone who was probably more in the background to someone who had to, she had to take charge. He's in. He's in. Dave claims to cook the most amazing green curry known to mankind, so hopefully he, uh, he's fit enough to cook me one of those green curries. Bit nervous. <laughs> because of, um, you know, I haven't done this kind of thing for a while. Pop it on. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah. I immediately felt very self-conscious because they hadn't visited our house before. How you doing? I'm good, good to see you. And also a bit defensive because they've had better success than us, so I, I felt a little revealed. But I was so drunk. Yeah. It was, I have memories in still frame, I can't yeah. actually remember. The way I feel toward Jet now is they're nice guys I, and I, I do enjoy their success. Yeah, I'm disappointed that Dave didn't have the success that, that they did, but I'm, I'm not bitter and it's, it's in the past. Now it's, it's just friendship. In terms of our own journey as, as Jet, there's a lot of strained relationships after these years and, and I think just a bit of distance will be fortuitous for all of us. Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Cheers, mate. Good to see you. Good health.
<laughs> I want it to be more like it was, you know. Then I want the naivety back. Dave is nothing but genuine. I'm going to have a, a cranioplast, and that means a titanium plate put into my head uh, to cover over where my, uh, my brain is. That's just skin. I do fear death. I have to say that I do fear death. But I fear death more for Leah and my children because my children, I want to be a father to them. I'm, I'm comfortable with who I am and what I've done. We all have regrets, but I'm, I'm, I, there's not many. I think I've had a pretty good life. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you. Oh, I oh, I all right. I'm feeling like I think it went fairly much to plan, unless you're all a dream. <laughs> and um, and I'm feeling all right, you know. No more helmet. And then we'll never tear us apart. It is a beautiful love story. I don't think anything would tear them apart, to be honest with you. Uh, they've really shown an incredible strength and commitment. I hope this story has a happy ending, yes. I trust it will be a happy ending for David and his family.